Hi everyone, so my name is um, Karen Burns and I'm the Business Development Director for CGI Estonia. Um, who, those who know, CGI is a global IT company and we run offices in, in quite many countries. Um, I'm really pleased to present this track because we have three amazing speakers and I'm really looking forward to, to what they have to say. And um, a little bit about my own background, I've worked in the UK the Middle East and also South Africa. So these regions and countries have very different leadership um, cultures and I've worked for some really lovely bosses uh, and also some seriously, seriously horrible ones as well. Um, wipe, you know, wiping my bosses spit off my face after being shouted at in the middle of a desert. Um, that's how bad it was. And my best leader, my best boss ever, was a gentleman in the UK who had never been to uni, who'd left school when he was 14 to become a programmer, but he was a really good people person. Um, so it doesn't always um, come with education, um, being a leader. Um, I guess leadership has evolved into a massive field of its own. If you read Harvard Business Review, you know that kilometers and kilometers of space is dedicated to how to be the best leader, what are the best qualities of being a leader. Um, I guess we dedicate a lot of time thinking and analyzing what leaders are like. And today's track has been built um, in a way where we take a broader view. Uh, Michael Anderson will, will lead this. Then we look at the company view. Johanna Bustinen from uh, Vincit is looking at that. And then we delve into even more detail. And Denise Arro will be looking at how hiring um, decisions are made. Um, a few more words about uh, Michael, who is getting ready uh, next to the stage there. Uh, Michael is a leadership trainer um, and an expert in leadership. And his clients include companies like Uber, um, Microsoft and Stanford University. Um, he's written many publications on the topic and uh, trains people globally. And uh, he will basically cover how to become, how, to, how you basically become a leader through learning, um, what kind of skill sets are needed, especially if you come from a technical background, what are the specific skill sets you need um, to become a leader and to make your team root um, for you. Um, and how, as a leader, you can't forget about your own uh, education and how to find the right mentorship. We will then move on to Johanna, like I said, and she will talk about the specific, um, quite an interesting thing that they do within Vincit. So Vincit is a software development company, and they were just voted the best employer in Europe. And they have an LAAS model within the company. So that's leadership as a service. And they've turned leadership mentoring and learning on its head. And I'm not going to say any more about it because um, then I would uh, give her a talk away. So she's going to come and, and talk about that. Um, and the track will be brought to a close by Tunis Arro, who is um, a headhunter and an executive coach. And he's the co-founder of uh, TeamScope, which is a company that helps make um, uh, better hiring decisions based on data. Uh, so he will talk about why nearly half of all leadership hirings go wrong and how, to, um, um, how, how it's important to deliver value-based learning and also how diversity is a lot more than just gender and race. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing all of these and let's give them a hand, guys. And uh, Michael, you're on, thanks. I was a horrible leader. When I started out, I was a good technical person. And when I started my first company, my second, my third company, I, they really relied on my techni technical ability, my hard work and my drive. But the more staff we got, the bigger, the larger we got, my bad leadership was really exposed. And it became a problem. It became a massive, massive problem. It became a problem in my, in my business life, in my personal life, for my mental health, my emotional health, it was a massive problem. And I said, hey, I really, really have to change this. I looked at my business goals, my per personal goals, and it's like, look, they all, ha all have to do with how good of a leader I am. And I worked really hard and I shifted. I transformed myself into a very, very effective leader. So much that my, my companies made the Inc. 5000 list, we were voted the best place to work, and I won Social Entrepreneur of the Year. And for me to make that transformation, 
there's five shifts, there's five secrets that I learned. And actually, they told me that you guys are really, really smart, so I broke it down into three, because we only got 15 minutes, I want to give you as much content as we can. So I want to teach you the, the three shifts that I had to learn to transform myself as a leader, and it's the same three shifts that I teach, like Karen said, SAP, Microsoft, Uber. And it's, the th it's the same three shifts that everybody that I've worked with, the tens of thousands of business owners I've worked with over the last bunch of years, learned to shift them into really, really effective leaders. Does that sound good? Would that be helpful if you got that out of here today? Good, I like you, because if you said no, I don't know what we talk about for the next 12 minutes, so it's good. Um, but I started out, I started out in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and it's by New York, it's in the Rust Belt of, of America, and I was a real, real geek. When I was about 13, year old, 13 years old, this is the, the, the early to mid 80s, my dad bought me an Apple II clone, I taught myself to code in my basement. When I was 16, 17, 18 years old, in, in, in high school age in the US, me and my buddies, instead of on a Friday or Saturday night going out, what we would do is we would get the newest video card or more RAM, upgrade our PCs and play the newest and coolest games. That was my social life around in high school. Needless to say, I wasn't having a lot of sex around then. So um, fast forward uh, uh, after I graduate university, my first job was as, as an IT technician. So I was the guy, I worked at this uh, uh, engineering software company when one of the people, they had a problem with their workstations, they couldn't print, they would call up to IT and they would send me down. And I would have to be the guy that, that crawled under their desk to see if all the, 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 the wires were connected right. And I'll tell you what, it's six foot eight or 2.03 meters, that wasn't a pretty sight, me under a desk. And I, I hated that job for a lot of reasons. But my cousin, he lived in California, and so we're talking on the phone right now and I tell him, man, I hate my job out here. He's like, Mike, if you hate your job, why not hate your job in California? Why don't you move your butt out to California and get a crappy job out here? At least we can enjoy, enjoy the sunshine. I'm like, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of logic in that. So I packed up all my stuff. I moved to California. Got started in computer software in, in ERP, Microsoft Dynamics and, and SAP type things. And um, that started my career in, 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 in corporate. Worked my way up the corporate ladder and then I came back to San Diego, uh, California, and I, I started my first business and then my second business and third business. And like I told you before, you know, I'm a good technical person. You know, I'm, I'm really analytical. I, I, I'll outwork any problem. I'll, I'll, I'll work as long as it needs to. I'm really, really focused. Um, and, you know, probably like a lot of you, it's like I, I put the, the company on my, on my technical ability and, and my will, and, and, it, and it did get it pretty far. But then cracks started appearing in the foundation. You know, we started to have problems with, with customers, problems with our culture. People started to quit that I never thought would quit. And then, and, and we were getting, because we had some success early, but then it seemed to all come crumbling down. And, and there's, a, there's a longer dramatic story that has to do with, with alcohol, drugs, assault, restraining orders, and lawsuit. You gotta, you gotta watch the Netflix special for that one. I won't go into it here. Um, but it's like, and, and I came to the point where I thought I was gonna lose everything. I thought I was gonna lose everything. And all that drama really put me into a depression. And I'm like, oh my gosh, am, am, am I even cut out to be a leader? Because at that time, you know, I, I, I had a bunch of staff, we had offices, we had all these things, but I had deep down within me, I thought I was a fraud because I was just trying to keep things going to the next day. I didn't know what I was doing. All of a sudden, I never ran a business before. All of a sudden, I have three, I have people, I have payroll, I have lawyers, I have accountants, I have line of credits, I have loans, I have this, I have that, things I never did before. It was a mad, the, the, the responsibility and the pressure was just crushing me. But I, I, I never could ever let anybody know that. It's like I was putting on this, this face to everybody else, but internally there was just chaos. And my biggest fear was that somebody was gonna find out and that it would all come crashing down. I'll tell you the weirdest thing, every time my phone would ring, in, in a millisecond, what I would think is, oh my God, it's gonna be a, a customer canceling their contract, the employees are gonna hear about it, they're gonna quit, my company's gonna go under, and I'm gonna lose everything, I'm gonna be homeless. This, this nanosecond, this happened, and I would just shake it off, but that, that actually would, would happen to me. And then I'm like, look, Mike, I gotta change something here. So um, I, did a lot of, I did a lot of training, I went to the, 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 the best teachers and trainers for leaderships in the world, and I also did something else interesting. I ended up earning a master's degree in spiritual psychology. When we say spiritual psychology, it has nothing to do with religion, but it's the psychology of love and compassion. Now I wanna give everybody here a, a little taste of what spiritual psychology is, so for the next 10 minutes, we're gonna do meditating and hugging. 
No, I'm just joking. It's funny, it's funny when I do that in Germany, they all forget, nine, nine hugging, nine hugging. So it, uh, it's good. But, you know, it, it, is, it is psychology, but it's a loving, compassionate focus. And when I started applying them to my business, my, my, my personal life, my personal life transformed. But when I started applying it to my businesses, my businesses started to flourish because I, I was making connections with my employees. I was really getting to know them. I, put, I created a great culture. We created these amazing relationships with our customers. We were giving back to the community. And like I told you earlier, you know, we won some awards, you know, the Inc. 5000 list, best place to work, et cetera. But that was on the outside. But on the inside, I was finally having fun. Because I think all of us get into business because we, we don't want to do good. Look, I'm not going to lie to you. I like making money. Money's fun, and I'm a competitor. And I want to create something special. I want to create something, again, for my employees, my customers. My, that's really important to me. And it's like I found it. I found that system. And then what happened is some of my friends in San Diego that own businesses said, hey, Mike, you know, what are you doing over there? Something, you, you, you're doing something right. So I started coaching and teaching and training them. And um, after 18 years in accounting software, now I, th I know you, you hear accounting software, you think that's the sexiest thing anybody ever, ever talked about. But after 18 years in accounting software, I figured I'm going to do something else because uh, I love those days. But now what I do is I teach other people how to, to, to do the same type of, of empowering um, leadership. And so that's, I'm just going to share a couple, share three big points. So hopefully that will make your leadership journey a little better. So the first point I want to share is you have to, to commit to transformation, commit to transformation. And now what I mean by that is I'm going to take the assumption is everybody in here is a smart person. You're a really good technical person. You're great at sales. You really understand marketing. Maybe it's social media. Uh, you know, so I was talking to this guy today. He was an investment banker. You are a smart person. You probably view, view yourself as this great coder that happens to lead a team. Well, that might be what you look at yourself now as, but you have to transform. You have to change how you view yourself. You have to change to being a leader that happens to be a smart person. Quit acting like you're not a leader. That is your job. Your job is to be strategic. Your job is to lead this team. But for some reason, we have this aversion to calling ourselves a leader, to stepping fully into that. It's like, we're not sure if we can take this leadership role, so I'm gonna play off of this salesperson, play off of this coder, play off of this marketing person. BS, if you wanna get to where you have to go, you have to, to tell yourself you're a leader and to start taking that as your new profession. Because you know, when, I was a, when, I, when I looked at myself as a technical person, here's what I was good at. I was very analytical. I was very hardworking. I would outwork the problem, right? I was very good at risk avoidance. I could work you know, off a task list real well. Now, when you own a company, all that's thrown out the window. 20% of that's important. Now you have to communicate. You have to have emotional intelligence. Instead of risk avoiding, you have to manage risk. You know what? You've got to take risks. That's what your job is. You just got to figure out how to take them. And all those things, and you have to go from being tactical from be, to being strategic, from looking at the, you know, the, what's right in front of you to how does this work with, with my investments from one year, from five years out. And I'll tell you, all those are learned skills. When they talked about are leaders born or are they lead, they're made, they're absolutely made. I'm a living example of it. Everybody I work with, all my friends, we're all living. I've seen everybody evolve as leaders. So start taking your leadership seriously. The second thing is great leadership is born out of great confidence. Great leadership is born out of great confidence. Because think about the, the leaders that you really admire and you respect. They have a confidence about them. They have a confidence about them. Everybody talks about vulnerability, and vulnerability is important. And we could talk more about vulnerability, but you don't, you're not vulnerable until you're confident in yourself. I can't share something deep with you until I have that inner relationship with myself that I'm confident. And so what I do work a lot, because I teach, what I tell people is there's a lot of leadership stuff out there, but it's actually management. What leadership is, is when you walk into a room, you want people to say, wow, that guy or that lady, they're the leader. You know, it's just the presence that you walk in with. And, 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 and we, we got to be careful because on one hand, there's shyness, right? And on the other hand, there's arrogance. But in the middle here is confidence. And confidence is all, often quietness, but it's a powerful quietness. But for me, before I learned all these things, I, I would hang out in shyness, and then I would be a bit of a jerky, arrogant dude, and then I would pop back to shyness. But neither of those are where we want to be. We want to be that confident person. And that doesn't mean I have to know everything. 
but I have to have confidence that we're going to get there. And that's how delegation occurs. That's how empowerment occurs. Because bad leadership comes from insecurity, right? Bad leadership comes from lack of transparency. Bad leadership comes from micromanagement. That's all control. That's all ego-based stuff. So that's why we want to move you into confidence. So the third thing is you have to find a mentor. You have to find a coach. You have to find people that will take you there. And I know you're like, hey, the guy on the... The coach on the stage is saying you have to find a coach. Yes, you know what I'm saying? You have to find a coach, whether it's me or anybody else. You have to find somebody who's going to take you through here because I didn't start really truly making massive strides until I got mentors, until I got coaches. I have three coaches right now. I have three mentors right now. So that's going to be your fastest way there. Um, Everybody knows, obviously, who Apple is. If you don't know what the company Apple is, you have to leave. We, we don't allow you in here, okay. And, uh, but if you don't know, Steve Jobs built Apple. He started Apple with Steve Wozniak when he was 22 years old. They went public at 25 years old. When he was 25 years old, he took Apple public. It was one of the largest IPOs in history. It was one of the largest companies. It, 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 you know, he's in his late, mid to late 20s. He was kicked out at 30 years old because he, although he was brilliant, he was a horrible leader. And then he went out, he got some coaching, got some mentoring, he got some wisdom, and then he came back, and then he, he, he re- revitalized um, Apple. And so that's what you need to do. You have to commit to transformation. You have to commit to changing yourself into start, qu- quit being this smart person, start being this leader person. Second thing is you have to work on your self-esteem. You have to work on your confidence because when you work on that, that's the type of people investors invest in. That's the type of people that are going to join your company and be loyal to you through thick and thin. They're going to turn down offers for more money or a better title because they believe in you. They believe in your vision. They believe in your purpose. And the third thing is you have to find mentorship. That's why it's good that you're here because you're surrounding yourself by people that are doing the same thing you are. And, and that community, that support is amazing because what you're doing now is you're probably putting yourself through more risk and more stress than you ever have in your life or you ever will in your life. And by, to have people to go to places like this, you need that support. Now, I also want to give back as much as I can to everybody because I know how difficult it is. So I just want to throw one thing out there is, well, I'm here. Uh, I have a couple, uh, I've, I've left the rest of today after our Q&A. It's going to be in about 45 minutes after all the, all the uh, speakers. I'm going to offer anybody who's out there that wants to do a one-on-one mentorship. No fee. We're just going to sit down. We're going to dig into you as a leader. Uh, if you go to this link right there, the tinycc uh, Mike Slat-50, um, you can book a day. And if you book today, we can meet one-on-one. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about where you're at as a leader and what your goals are and what you need to get there. And I'm going to book four of these, and it's going to be for the rest of the day because I cleared out the rest of my day until the dinner. So if you want to reach out to me, if, if you have any questions, comments, I love hearing from people. I love talking about this thing. Um, you can drop me an email. I want to hear what your experience is and how I can help you to the, get to the next level. So thank you, everybody. It's, it's really great talking to a bunch of people that happen to be smart people and also are great leaders. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Johanna Pystynen, and today I'm going to talk about uh, our quite unique management model that uh, we call leadership as a service. And that means that we don't anymore offer this kind of a traditional management. Instead, we actually uh, offer leadership services that our employees order uh, through our online store. And I will tell you soon how it works. But before this, uh, I will show you a few facts about Winzip. So the company, we are a software service company, and it was founded in 2007, and it started as a two-man company. When I joined the company in 2012, there were 50 male engineers, and nowadays we have 480 employees. So we have grown quite fast lately. But this uh, rapid growth, uh, that is not the only challenge we have faced uh, recently. Uh, We also uh, are coping with the challenges that, that the work life today is, is offering us, you know. We work with the startups, we work with the uh, world's biggest companies, we uh, do cooperation with the media sector, we do projects for the manufacturing, we work with the final sector, 
And this means that we have uh, lots of moving parts all the time going on in our organization. We don't know what happens next. Uh, it is a constant change, and we have to try to cope with this change. And I think this is typical today for the companies. You know, it is about this transformation of work life. It's not the same anymore. Companies ha have to, you know, forget old things, learn new things, and people inside the company has, has to have skills uh, in, in this uh, environment. And uh, what we figured out was that we were trying to lead this kind of environment with the old tools, you know. We had those tools that we were learned to believe that we need them in order to do great management. For example, uh, we did have these annual anonymous uh, well-being questionnaires. Once a year, we gathered lots of data, and then we started to guess what we should do with the data. And then we did a lot of guesses and a lot of uh, uh, projects created based on those guesses and implemented those. But we never knew where, where these uh, things really effective. Do they actually influence on our end targets? And, and is the time and money, uh, uh, you know, what we put in these tasks, is it enough to increase our people's happiness and well-being? The other problem was that uh, we did have these kind of performance appraisals or development discussions, as we say in Finland, once a year, because we thought that we have to have these discussions. And uh, we also uh, had these manager roles and managers for having these performance appraisals. And the uh, problem was that our managers were software engineers, you know. So their whole background, history, studies, daily job was about software engineering. And at the same time, we wanted them to be, you know, more empowering coaches and, and giving their employees support in career development and competence development and well-being. And it wasn't working. You know, they were feeling quite much pressure because we wanted them to be better and better and better in leadership. But they didn't have time, they didn't have skills, and, and they didn't know how to do it. Well, a uh, third problem was that we did a lot of speculation when we tried to make decisions and, and, and development. For example, if we wanted to increase people's happiness, the human resources team started to guess what we should do next, you know. We arranged a lot of different events and campaigns and support, but, but then we never knew, uh, are we doing the right things, you know? And if we are doing some things, who they serve and who they are not serving. So we knew that we have to guess all the time. In management, in support functions, we are doing most of our decisions based on guessing. So we were lacking all the data that we had with the customers, you know? In management, we didn't have this kind of data and understanding about our, our uh, work. And then uh, the one problem was that we were leading these things separately, you know. We did have well-being here, we had tools for well-being here, and, and we were leading it separately from competence development, that we have uh, own tools for, the, for this area. And then also we had teams separately, and we had uh, uh, different kind of uh, projects uh, going on. But, but they never link to each other, and in real life they are a part of the same system. So the problem was that we weren't seeing the links between these areas because the data didn't speak uh, between each, each of these sections. And then uh, the last problem was that, that when I joined the company, there were 50 engineers coming from the same background, you know. But suddenly we did have uh, people coming from an art background, designers, for example. We had 20-year-old students working with us and also 50-year-old mother of two working with us, and they appreciated totally different kind of leadership. And, and still we had the same system for all, you know. We had those yearly discussions with the same concept, and it wasn't working as uh, anyone at all, you know. People were wanting different kind of things from leadership, and, and we didn't have the tools to offer this kind of unique leadership. So when we understood these things, we knew that we have to change the whole perspective, uh, how we see leadership. And uh, we actually decided to start thinking our employees as internal customers. And we started to do this kind of internal service design. So if uh, human resources, for example, offers services, what kind of services they would be? Uh, could, for example, financial team offer services to people uh, and help them to understand uh, financial issues better? Or could people uh, offer services to each other in our company? And uh, when we started to doing this thing, we decided to, you know, uh, 
changed the whole concept of leadership and, and created this kind of a tool also to, to help us to cope with the uh, change. And here you can see our last system, which is leadership as a service. And uh, this is uh, like an online store. And our um, employees go there every third month and we ask them to choose this, their services. There are at the moment about 150 services, and uh, uh, we have about 100 service providers in-house. We also have external service providers, but, uh, but people are offering their own services based on their skills, for example. And uh, uh, this is open all the time, but every third month we ask them to choose what they want to use next three months. Uh, here you can see some of the top services at Vincit at the moment. There is a power lunch with the manager, usually with the CEO, so you can book a lunch with the CEO and talk whatever you want to talk with him. Uh, there are mentorship uh, options. Uh, you can go to hang around with the sales guy when he meets customers and learn this way about the sales instead of going to a course. Uh, study groups where people meet each other uh, every week. Uh, finance team gives this introduction to finances to people. Uh, they go through this financial statement and talk about where the money goes, where, where it comes, and so on. Kill a rumor uh, is a popular service. You know, every rumor can be... Uh, they uh, they tell, it, tell the rumors us, and then we go through every week what rumors are uh, real and what are not, uh, and different kind of uh, services. We also, at the moment, people are offering these kind of skill-based services. So when they know something about certain technology, for example, they bring their own services or course or mentoring uh, team and, and offer uh, these, these to others. Uh, but also these kind of free time services like swimming, singing, sushi course, DJ course, what just held in Tampere. So, so this way also making visible what they can do uh, uh, along with their uh, professional skills. Uh, we also use data to create this understanding what is working and what is not, and where to put the money and energy next. So here you can see a picture about the data we gather. This is only a demo, so those services are not real ones, but, uh, but as you can see, you can see uh, services based on quality and also uh, based on usefulness or influence. And every time when people use these leadership or support services, we ask them to evaluate how beneficial those services were. And this way we gather all the time more and more understanding what is working, what is not. And if we see that there are one-star services, usually provided by human resources, so then we know that we have to change something, you know. And we have uh, quite many one-star services that are nowadays five-star services, because we have identified that these are the things that are not working, even though they are good ideas, from, from, uh, or we think they are good ideas, and then we have changed something, see what happens in this tool, you know. Do they give more, better evaluations, and are we going to the right direction? And this way, making also all the time experiments about where we should go next, what is effective and appropriate, and, and this way also reduce waste in the organization. We don't provide any uh, services that are not ordered, you know. So even though we have 150 services, we only provide those that we need, uh, see that are needed. So this way it is also cost effective because, because we know where to concentrate next and where to put all in next. Uh, well, this way we actually have brought the whole system together. We have also, for example, well-being questionnaire in this tool. So when people fill in their details uh, and get their own index, the last tool will suggest what services they could use next based on their own results. So this way we bring also the well-being to the system and services. We have competence uh, questionnaire there, so you can uh, evaluate your skills and based on your index, it will al always uh, provide you services that you could use next in the areas you need more training, for example. And then we can also see what happens when people use competence development services, do their competence increase, and uh, if it does, what it means for the well-being, for example. So bringing the data to the same pool and, and seeing the correlations between these areas is uh, crucial for us to make better decisions. So that we know that we have, if we put money here, it might be influenced actually here, and so on. So this systematical approach is uh, quite important nowadays uh, to us. It also brings understanding to 
uh, people because you know companies are talking about self leadership it's like a trend nowadays to to self management uh, in the organizations and uh, the problem is that it is not easy for the people you know they they don't know how to do it and and it usually it is because they don't have enough understanding about their environment about the company about how their competence is compared to others and so on so this way we pr uh, bring the understanding to people so that they can make better decisions. They know what they are offered and, and they can be autonomical with these decisions. And also bring the understanding to, to uh, managers because managers will become more, you know, coaching type of, uh, uh, the role will change to this kind of a coaching role. And you, you cannot do it if you don't have understanding about the unique needs, you know, or like what the company can offer to people and so on. So also giving the understanding to the managers. And final level to the company. So when company can see the correlations between uh, each area, they also know where to put the resources next. And this way uh, increase their uh, uh, effectiveness and, and uh, have more uh, value to the money and time and energy they are putting uh, to these actions. Uh, this actually, we, we created this tool for Vincit, but uh, it became a product to us also. So many companies in Finland asked whether or not they could actually try this kind of a tool and philosophy in their own company, and we decided to try. And now we have 40 companies in Finland who are now uh, using this tool and this philosophy also in their, their own organizations. We have a lot of public sector organizations that are totally different than Vincit's environment. And it has been quite interesting to see how this kind of a philosophy can be actually implemented to, to totally different contexts, because the, the problem there is the same than in modern companies, you know. They have to somehow change their management style to support the change they are coping with. And, and by giving people more understanding and helping them to make uh, their own decisions and leading themselves, uh, they are having great results. Uh, to go forward with this. So we have uh, universities, cities, uh, we have uh, national broadcasting companies, uh, uh, we have energy companies and so on. So to uh, quite many contexts where we now are trying to, to implement this, this uh, philosophy. But yeah, uh, I think all in all, uh, that is my cup of tea. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can ask them uh, after this. And I think we are going to discuss these things uh, later also. So thank you. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon. My name is Tonis, and uh, I will tell you something about teams and, and about Hiring. And first, I will. That first, I will say who I am, because you might have forgotten. It was a long time when I was introduced. Uh, Thirty minutes at least. So then I tell why teams are important, then why hiring goes wrong, and how to do better. So that's my plan. So myself, I am a headhunter. I have been doing this for 25 plus years. I'm so old, unfortunately. And today I'm with two companies. Uh, one is Executive Lab, that, that's my executive search and professional search boutique company. And the, 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 the other one is TeamScope, which is a technology company, which we have built together with a great team. We, most of them are here. Um, and the, what it does is uh, it analyzes teams. It's a SaaS machine learning tool. And uh, it measures about 100 data points per person and correlates them and then builds through a complicated algorithm, which I don't understand what those guys here do, uh, visualizes the, the team, and this picture then, interactive picture or dashboard, can be used for hiring purposes or for team development purposes. So it helps to uh, do decisions like based on data, not just uh, speculation. Uh, and why teams are important? Michael mentioned this. Uh, uh, individualist <laughs> who didn't actually care about teams much uh, in the beginning, but even he realized very well that actually the great things are achieved by teams. And this, the next picture is by Deloitte describing nowadays organizations 
which, uh, which are actually interwoven networks of teams. So everybody belongs into one or two teams, some temporary, some virtual, or so. So team is important. And to be a team leader, what you need first is to have to hire a group of people who wants, uh, lets uh, you to lead them. But hiring goes wrong very, very often. 40% of professional hires goes wrong in, in this sense that the person who is hired leaves like in the uh, first 18 months. So it's a hiring mistake. And the main reason for this is that the, pe the people who are hired, they don't fit well together with the people they have to lead or to work with. And it's an expensive thing. It's one or two years salary is the replacement cost. So, and why is it happening? Because the, the humans make the decisions, not machines, unfortunately. <laughs> and um, humans have uh, this kind of two, two systems of thinking, as you know probably, Mike Kahneman's two systems. That's one is fast thinking, intuitive, immediate, emotional. The other one is slow thinking. And what I'm saying is that Often the hiring is done with uh, speed thinking, not the slow one. Look at these pictures. Unfortunately, I'm sorry. You probably, depending on your sex and your preference, you will look either left or, or right side more. And I'm sorry, the left one being bigger, uh, it's probably our designer is male. It uh, might be the reason. But uh, actually, now think about two questions about, these, uh, about the person you are looking now. One is, do I want to have sex with this person? And the other question is, do I want to marry this person? So first question you can answer like this. It's intuitive, quick, emotional. But the second question should be answered slowly, if you are smart. And what about hiring decisions, how these are made? I al already jumped to the conclusion earlier, of course, they should be made slowly. But how they are made, actually, let us look. What happens if you meet another person? You shake hand with a person you haven't seen earlier. You have lots of information, actually. You, you touch, smell, see, remember something immediately. That is actually information overload when you meet a new person. And what, what your brain does, protecting you from this overload, is simplifying, classifying. This person reminds me of someone I have met before, for example, like this. And so it happens that actually the, the decision is made in the first two minutes of the interview. There is solid data proving this. And the rest, 48 minutes or 50 minutes, is just spent to justify this decision, which is made in the first two minutes. Quick thinking. So you might say that, uh, well, we, are, we don't do this, we do testing. But what is testing actually? What does tests mean? Belbin was mentioned here. What does the Belbin test give you if you do it in hiring situation? Actually, what it does, it helps to calm you down because uh, executives are anxious. They know all these stories I, I have told you that lots of hirings go wrong. So they are anxious making this mistake, which is an expensive mistake. So let's do something to avoid this. Let's do tests. But most of the tests, what they do, they only measure individual. The individual personality traits, they have nothing to do with the team the person is going to work with. And the team was the main reason why they leave early, remember. So what we, what we need to do is, yeah, what, what, what the best recruitments do, they consider qualifications, competencies, also sometimes values and personality, but most often than not, it's just do with qualifications, things which, which what are on CV, and then your gut feeling, and that's it. You know, this, there is a famous story about one of the Skype co-founders, early days of Skype, when someone came to an interview, and then the, one of the co-founders was going to meet this person and asked, so how long you have used Skype? And the person said, no, well, actually, I have thought about starting to use it. Okay, goodbye. So it was a very short interview, a very quick decision. But uh, was it a good one? Why, why to invite this person at all there? It actually, she, the, the person shouldn't be invited to interview at all if that was the criteria. But the quick decisions are made every day. And unfortunately, we only study qualifications, whether this person has Java programming skills or does he do Python or something, because that's easy. 
but to how to how to evaluate values this is difficult so we have investigated actually uh, almost everything which is written about teams and that's the two conclusions what you need is similarity in values and diversity in everything else and i repeat everything else not just not just your uh, skin color or just your um, race or something or your sex i will show you two pictures these are picture a uh, value mapping pictures so the the closer the people on the picture the dots there the closer they are in their values so this first group is a group of people who were working on a play group of actors it was an improvisational play and the idea was that they were they were play the play idea of the play was that the people are living like a couple of months together in an is isolated place arctic circle somewhere or south pole or something like this and they wanted to be tested first to see how they fit together and w when they showed the, saw this picture w which i showed them i said that you, there will be never any conflicts you are so similar in your values so if you want to build conflict in your play let someone write the script and the second picture that's a management group of a company when i first saw this picture i, I didn't believe it it's not possible they have nothing in common actually they had one thing in common they valued independence very highly but nothing else so when i looked when when i started discussing with them i thought this is kind of technical error or something it appeared that the chairman and the ceo hadn't had a word face to face for half year guess what happened after after a couple of months the ceo left and after half year this company which was actually a very important well known company ceased to exist so values similarity is something you would like to get in hiring that gets people engaged they like to be together and so on and so on but what about diversity then and that's mo much more about diversity than just uh, sex and 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 color what we suggest to look is diversity in behaviors diversity in personalities and this picture it's about our team actually but maybe it's not so well well seen but it's it shows how we look like in uh, all the personality traits which can be measured there is this big five maybe familiar to some of you if i look at the left one it's extraversion if we look closer there is the dots on the on the line are all on the left and our average extraversion or so openness to social interaction is very low so what we want to do with this scale if we want to increase diversity in this team do we want uh, actually all all except mine are female this is my search boutique so simple solution would be let's get a black male a, a male person better colored but what we actually need is someone who is outgoing because what it means that we are on the left we don't like to go to conferences we don't like to go to cocktail parties we like to be on our own so but we need someone who goes out there talks to clients talks to new people does networking so what i mean if you if you are serious about diversity you need an extrovert person and it doesn't matter whether it's male or female so that's my main message if i summarize just don't trust your gut feeling don't do quick decisions in hiring uh, look for similarity in values and diversity in real sense not just sex and color and then get data and digest it before you see the person it's important before you see the person because if you see him you have already made the decision so that's it if you want to hear more talk to me or the guys here with nice hoodies with the team scope sign thank you great thank you very much to um, all the speakers I hope you found the presentations interesting. I sure did. Um, from my personal takeaways, um, um, there were actually some really, really good points um, about of hiring, values, etc. Like I mentioned earlier, I've worked in some really weird but also wonderful teams, both diverse and not so diverse. Um, so I think being a woman uh, in a country that has the highest 
um, pay gap in the European Union, I think we've had it for the past 10 years, um, is really relevant that uh, women aspire more to leadership and actually gain leadership positions. Um, so gender and race are not maybe key, but they definitely are one of the foundations to uh, diversifying and getting more neurodiversity into teams, which is what leads to success. Um, to continue the discussion, uh, we are going to move now with the panelists to the TransferWise Q&A area, which is down the stairs to your right, end of the hallway, and then there's a really comfy area with the stage, cushions, coffee, and we have about half an hour for all of your questions. Um, the team will give answers, panelists will give answers to it. And I just checked, all of Michael's slots were booked within the first 10 minutes of him uh, revealing the, um, the URL. So whoever was lucky enough to get time with him, um, congratulations. But for now, there's another half an hour of Q&A session happening at the TransferWise area. So uh, I hope you guys will join us there and continue, the, continue to enjoy sorry, um, the rest of the day. Thank you very much.